promise, uh, comrade Mutama, you know. So I was like, this is this is this is this is kind, okay. Uh, it is very unusual for Black First Land First to be invited and to debate our primary enemy. Uh, white monopoly capital, which is what the, the, this chamber and all other chambers represent. And please, white monopoly capital is not the creation of some British PR firm. In fact, since 1962, the Communist Party of South Africa with Joe Slovo, the big intellectual that uh, those of you went to VETS and UCT and Rhodes uh, have uh, uh, read about, uh, was part of the people who coined the term white monopoly capital to describe the South African uh, ruling class. So it is not this British. So for us, um, this is talking to uh, almost like walking into enemy territory. I earlier on took some pictures and I'm, I'm still traumatized by this, uh, <laughs> by this experience, you know? So I'm standing there before this. I hope, you know, you, 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 you understand my difficulty. I also went to the website, you know, the uh, Facebook of the, the chamber and I saw somebody warning Dr. Dan David Roth that uh, he must bring his bodyguards tonight. <laughs> Of course, earlier on in this week, we were in Parliament, is it uh, last week, we were in Parliament, right? And there was the, the Oppenheimers, you know, the real uh, dynasty of South African capital. And we had a very friendly engagement with uh, Nikki and Jonathan, you know? So we were surprised when people are, are losing their heads that you have invited us uh, to speak here. I also want to acknowledge quickly the presence of the provincial leadership of our movement. Let me be clear from the onset that I do not believe in dialogue with those who have taken our land. We move from the honest recognition that there is an irreconcilable point of departure between the oppressor and the oppressed. We can't reconcile these points of departure between the landless and those who stole their land, between the colonizer and the, co and the native. And to bring it closer to home, we as Black First Land First do not believe that there's an ethical, dialogical exchange between whites and blacks. Because there is a prior problem of what separates us, which has not been addressed. Therefore, when we enter into a dialogue, it's a false dialogue. Because it is not a dialogue of equals. You still have our staff. Huh? And how can you, I mean, I think about a little bit. So a guy steals your car and then you meet them in the street. You, can, you, you must disregard the fact that the guy's got your car. Now you must have some kind of a dialogue. <laughs> Even dialoguing over the car is unethical. The person must give you back the car. And then you can enter into an ethical engagement. See, Nelson Mandela, when he was talking to white people here, he was trying to do something now I recognize as it's important. He only made it possible for us as black people to be able to control the army, to control the police, to control the intelligence. In fact, I think soon we'll be able to control the judiciary as well. And you will realize soon why that is important. I'm, I was one of those young people who said Mandela is a sellout, but I see now that maybe the deal, yeah, was bad because it prolongs the revolutionary process, but now the state is by and large, at least those elements of repressive elements of the state. What does that mean? It means, and I will, I'll talk about the inevitable uh, civil war, which must resolve the historical question. When that happens, a large chunk of the state will not be as repressive as the white state would have been. So that is, I think, the gift of Nelson Mandela to to us. I will jump this stuff on, on, on decolonization and, 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 and Fanon and so on. I want to say that I, I am not here to be understood. I don't, want to, I don't want to be understood. It will be to ask too much from white people to understand me. Because if you understand me, you will then have to commit class suicide, obliterate your position in this society as owners of the means of production. That's an impossibility, it, it cannot happen. 
So I'm not here to be understood. I'm here to simply tell you this, that there's a group of black people in this country who do not accept the deal which is continuing up to now. We are here to take back that which belongs to us. In fact, we must start with Nando's. You know, I was thinking about Nando's. That <laughs> so Nando's uh, sells chicken, right? So where is this chicken raised from? From whose land? Our land. So we take the land and we take the chicken as well. And I mean, as I said, no, we don't want the chicken feet. The problem of the chicken feet is that right now we eat the chicken feet. So there is no, you see, black people are in a perpetual state of crisis. So this idea that you do land redistribution, there'll be trouble. No, we are in trouble now. So the economic amalgam that you have, you, 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 you must be scared. I mean, if I was white and I was part of capital, I would be. Because it means that the reconfiguration in a much more radical sense of my state of being. Let's talk about the land question. Whose land? No, the land belongs to black people, African people. And these African people include the Khoi and the Sun. In fact, let me make it clear that this, what I call Mampur colonial historiography. You know Mampur, the Buddha drinking Mampur? It's Mampur colonial historiography that tried to separate the Khoi and the Sun from the African. It's just nonsense. It's apartheid nonsense. The Khoi and the Sun are African just like I am. In fact, I am Khoi San. Look at my nose. Try to pronounce my surname. So, so there's, there's, there is this separation. It's the, it's the nonsense of Afri Forum, which ran away from us, by the way. We were invited with Afri Forum, supposed to be here. Afri Forum is going to be there on Twitter insulting us tonight, as they always do. But when it comes to debaters, they run away. But they have the money, of course, because they're part of the land thieves. Afri Forum comes to the Western Cape, give money to some of our people here, call them kings of the Koi and the Sun, and say, the, the, the Kosa and the Nguni have uh, stolen your land. And then they go to speak to the king of the, of the Zulu people, King Good, Goodwill Zonitid, and say to him, oh, we can help you. Good. King Goodwill Zonitid is Nguni. When they speak amongst the uh, people here, the Koi and the Sun, they say the Nguni stole your land and they were involved in genocide. When they go there to speak to the king, our king, they say to the king, we will help you against land expropriation without compensation. So we know this is the old story of dividing and ruling us. I'm very happy to say that the king has not accepted this proposition that they did together with the boor. They must stop land expropriation without compensation. The stupid uh, proposition is Julius Malema, Motlante, and Sir Ramaphosa, who are saying they want expropriation of land of black people. They want to expropriate the land of the king. No, land expropriation is about taking land from white people, giving it to black people. Not taking the land of black people. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, the land was stolen from us through various means, in, but in particularly because of the superiority of the arms of the invading colonizer. There can be no valid treaty agreement between the oppressor and the oppressed. All those uh, documents that sometimes uh, referred to by historians are documents of uh, the oppressor. Whites in South Africa have no land rights. Their right to land emanates from conquest. And I mean, I, I accept this proposition. That the land that white people have and the property, and I, I, I don't make the, that uh, distinction, is property that gained out of conquest. Now, of course, what that means is simply this. If we want our land back, then it means we must engage in a process of reconquest. You're not going to give us that land. We fought for it. You bled for it. That is why the idea that land is, is, has got no value make, doesn't make sense. White people killed us to get this land, and they were prepared to die for the land. If we want land, of course, it simply means we must be equally prepared to do so. That's why we say land or death. Who's death? Who's death? Um... I could go on a little bit about, let me just say this, uh, uh, in Africa, we have an African saying in all our languages almost, it says, in other words, a debt does not decay because of time. This historical debt of land dispossession, that is not going to 
Now, all of a sudden, somehow, miraculously, because of time, because land thieves are selling each other stolen property, somehow this become legitimized into, no, uh, 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 legitimate uh, uh, position, no. I want, to, I want to move now on just one, disp what is the impact of land dispossession? From land ownership emanates the control of the means of production. The entire economy is based precisely on this. You can't jump steps. Dr. Uh, uh, Root, you, you can't jump to technology, education, and so on. You start from the, the original position. Go to Taiwan, go to Japan, go to South Korea, go to China. The successful models of, if you like, industrialization and technological development. Japan, in particular, 1945, radical land redistribution kickstart the accumulation process on a much more equitable basis. This is true for China. You here say, no, don't do that. Jump to technology and skills. I know a lot of black people who have degrees from even these uh, prestigious universities can't get jobs because we have not addressed the original question. Let me just give you this uh, a statistic, for instance, quickly. But the point is this, land ownership gives you control of the economy, and I want to argue also control over the state itself. And we will debate about the, the, the state because we have different notion of the state. Importantly, from land ownership emerges identities. And this is an important point for me. Whites are united by a common thread which links them back to land theft. And it's an irrational bond that comes from this. Let me give you some facts and show you this bond. South Africa is a country of about 123 million hectares. We have about 58 or 56 million people. Whites constitute about 4.5 million people in South Africa. But here is the fact. Only 35,000 white people own 80% of the land. That's not even, can't fill up a stadium. You know, all political, black political parties, they fill up stadiums, you know, regularly, right? So, if we took all the white people who own this, about 8% of the land, they will not fill up a stadium. But I said this white people is 4.5 million people. So the majority of white people actually do not have land. So this idea that they are the defense force of white monopoly capital, the elite, white class, is irrational. A rational proposition would have mean the white working class, the white poor, join together with black people and actually dispossess the white elite. So the land question is not an uh, economic question. It's a question about who are you. And that's why white people, the white working class, is prepared to defend its ruling class, its proper ruling class, its actual economic enemies. Let me, continue, let me just continue and show you this. South Africa is a semi-arid country. We know this. I hope we know that. Only 20% of South Africa is highly uh, productive in terms of fertile, in terms of agricultural produce. And of this 20%, it's very important, this statistic, is owned by about 7,000 white families and about six, seven conglomerates, agricultural conglomerates. And from this 20% of the land, 80% of the agricultural produce come from this piece of land owned by about 7,000 only. So it's a highly concentrated ownership structure of the economy, of the agricultural economy. So the point I'm making is the majority of white people should not be opposing white uh, uh, redistribution of land, but of course they do. The point is the, the land ownership in South Africa explains a lot of things, but I'll jump, let me come to land expropriation. We believe in land expropriation without compensation and for two on two grounds. The first ground is the historical one, the historical redress. We said land is stolen. Land was taken, land must be redressed, must be returned. What you're going to do with the land is a secondary question. So the first premise is land expropriation without compensation because land was taken, therefore land must be returned. But there is also a second premise, which is important and it's an economic one, interestingly. A fair distribution of land is good for, the economy, for economic development. In South Africa, if we were to look at just two sectors, agricultural and mining, we argue that in fact, because of the inefficiency of those sectors, even if, say, there was no land question of the historical land theft, you will still have to radically redistribute those sectors. Take mining, 
Mining in South Africa, we know that we, we are about, uh, the value of mining in South Africa about 20 trillion rand. I mean, in terms of the, 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 the known uh, mineral resources, 20 trillion. So we're almost one of the top, top five, probably, if not top three of the world in terms of known minerals on earth. 80% of platinum is in this country. But mining gives us only about 400,000 jobs. I'm saying to you, that is highly inefficient. Only for that reason, you should be redistributing that economic sector. Take agriculture, right? It doesn't produce more than, I think, 700,000 jobs, bad jobs. And then on top of that, you are, uh, the white farmers are killing us, black people. I don't know if white people eat pap, but we eat maize, pap, and 90% of this pap is GMO. Nowhere on earth do you feed people genetically modified food, at least maize. You go to Europe, they have outlawed this China, Russia, people who care, they don't do this, care for their people. So for these two reasons, both historical redress and even for economic reasons, you will actually do land expropriation without compensation. Now, the, of course there's a problem. In the first phase of redist once you expropriate, there's going to be a, crisis, a deepening of a crisis. That's what Zimbabwe is going through. Zimbabwe is going through a serious crisis. And, and that crisis is not just because Zimbabwe redistributed land, it's because there's external factors. The attack of the Zimbabwe economy is, a, is an imperialist attack on that economy. Because, of course, they touch white interests. But Zimbabwe is 300 years ahead of black South Africans. Because Zimbabweans are not tenants in Zimbabwe, they own Zimbabwe. We black people in this country are tenants, you are landlords. So we have not begun. So we are already in an ongoing recession as black people, not because there is an, a, a revolutionary crisis which is addressing a problem. We, we just in this permanent state of exclusion because that's how the structure of this economy is like. So Zimbabwe is 300 years, black Zimbabweans are 300 years ahead of us black South Africans. We don't own this country. We are all foreigners, black people in this country. Now, the current, the current racist land ownership pattern in South Africa and the colonial economic structure is even bad for the bourgeois economy. I mean, you, I think we can argue that. Precisely for these arguments I'm making about both the agricultural sector and, and mining. And, and we know that in agriculture, part of the recession, the technical recession, which is just affecting white people, because we have always been in recession, it is, it is caused by the agricultural sector's economic terrorism, because they are not producing uh, as part of trying to pressurize government to stay away from this land expropriation question. Let's talk, ab uh, let's talk about uh, the invita let, let me give you, I'm going to give you now in conclusion, I'm going to give you firstly the bad news and then I'm going to give you the, the good news. <laughs> the bad news for you is that, and I believe this, that a, a, a land war is an inevitable in South Africa. The manipulation of the national discourse by the ruling class through the ownership of the media, your capacity to be able to say who is corrupt using proxies to purge your opponents, including uh, Zuma, using Julius Malema and others to get rid of Zuma. The capturing of the ANC under Ramaphosa by white monopoly capital. The open bias of the judiciary. The white arrogance of forces such as Afri Forum and the Open Armour family and the Rupert family. The deepening poverty alienation of black people. These are the building blocks towards this Armageddon, which will happen. When the Guptas landed at Waterloo military base, there was so much noise and well-funded campaigns that ended up getting rid of Zuma. The banks of the Guptas were shut down and they were chased out of the country. You all call that state capture and corruption. You're all correctly very unhappy. But let me give you an interesting scenario. The Oppenheimer family, both Nikki and Jonathan Oppenheimer, goes to the head office of the ANC and demand that the ANC, not government, the ANC, give them an international airport of their own. 
Let me repeat that. We were angry, correctly so, when the Guptas landed at, at, at Waterproof. Landed. Here, the open eye must go to the ANC, demands an international airport inside an international airport. And the ANC gives them this international airport inside an international airport. And that is okay. The open eye must who are involved in diamond trading. So what is happening here? They fly to Kimberley, take our diamonds, fly to the international airport, out of the country, go somewhere else, get guns and other things, fly back into their own private international airport, and so on. It goes on. The point is, the sense of outrage by people who are anti-corruption is, is, is biased and it is, it is influenced by, by who uh, is on the other side. Gweda Mantashe wrote a letter to say to Nikki and them, yeah, you have the international airport now. Our court, including the Constitutional Court, doesn't see anything wrong with this. I don't have to tell you that the open IMRs through the DBS process don't pay tax for uncut diamonds expo exporting them. I'm sure you know that. They were called in Parliament in 2007. They could not produce the agreement that they said that exclusion or that exemption was based on. And the media dropped that question because, you see, corruption is when you are not white. Let me now give you the good news. I'm saying this, the bad news is there's going to be a war for land. And this war for land is not just the physical question of land, but it is our sense of exclusion in our own country in every area of life. How are you going to solve that? We are sufficiently angry and I have seen enough people who are ready to actually do what is the ultimate sacrifice to, to solve this problem for, for, for their children and for the future. So I'm, I'm confident that that war is coming. Here is the good news for you. The good news is that there's not going to be any land expropriation without compensation. There's not going to be amendment of the constitution. White capital has done a good job with Julius Malema and Sir Ramaphosa. They are highly compromised. There is no way Ramaphosa is going to go and expropriate land without compensation. We saw what happened in Marikana together with Lonmin. He protected Lonmin's interest to the point of actually engineering a massacre. Julius Malema himself, he makes enough noise and some of you get terrified, white monopoly capital, and then you make that the call during the middle of the night, and then of course you deliver some things to him, and then of course the whole thing goes away. So no, no, the good news is, at least in the medium term, short medium term, there's not going to be land expropriation without compensation. I mean, I can go into why, I mean, if you look at the parliamentary process, you know that there have been hearings and you know that there's a report that will only come at the end of this month. There's no way that they're going to be able to bring a bill, even if they wanted, because bring a bill takes about 410 days just to introduce the bill. If they wanted to uh, expropriate land without compensation, they would have used an instrument which is available to them already because... President Zuma did not sign the expropriation bill. So all they needed to do in February this year was to say, we agree we're going to now amend the constitution and then go to the expropriation bill, which has been rejected by Zuma, and draft it so that already it fast tracked the process of land expropriation without compensation. So in the, in, the, in the medium term, no, don't worry. These guys are just using the land expropriation discourse to get votes from black people next year. It is about elections next year. It's not about expropriating you. So what about those of us who do want to expropriate you? You see, we are not going to take your money. We are not going to take your calls. We are organizing ourselves. You already know, I'm sure some of you, that uh, Johan Rupert has got 10 interdicts against our movement. He had to go to court because we have identified 10 farms of his and we have organized people to go to take these farms. And he ran to the high court. But you see, Johan Rupert's problem is this. And there's a problem of white people. He's got too many farms. <laughs> so he's got interdict against us on 10 farms. Okay, we say, good, Johan Rupert. Those 10 farms, maybe we'll not take them now. What about the 100 others? So here is what's going to happen. We are clear that both the EFF and ANC will not amend the Constitution before the, 19, the 2019 elections. 
we as Black First Land Fair shall, shall, Black First Land Fair shall uh, simply lead a process of a people's led land expropriation. We are already identifying farms, we are identifying houses as well. Uh, uh, I think this process is difficult, but, uh, but, but I don't think it's it can be easily stopped. And I, and, I, and I can tell you now, I mean, if I, if I were to be an informant just for a little while, we do take houses in white suburbs. And often when that happens, they call the police. But the police who arrive are black people. And so we start speaking in Kosa or in Zulu or in Spedi or any of our African languages. We said, but this house has been standing here with no one for the past three years. So what is the problem? These white people are overhoused. We have no houses. And so the police drive away. <laughs> so now what you must do, you must go to court. Yes, we will go to court on the 19th. Uh, the high court will probably evict us, we'll pro but, but what, what the truth is, we already have identified other 20 houses. So we're, I'm talking about property in the urban white settlements. Brooklyn, places like this. And on farms we're doing the same, we're identifying. So we're, we're, I'm saying to you here, you will not be able to buy off the black legitimate rage that can only be addressed by addressing the historical question. But this burden of addressing this historical question, I don't think it is yours. I can't ask you to do so. If I was white, male, capitalist, in fact, I will, in fact, exactly, I will speak like uh, Professor maybe David wrote, but also I will think that somebody who speaks like me is crazy. Because you will now go to speak to government, you'll meet government, and government will assure you that there's law and order, there's all these things. But I'm saying to you, that law and order, the, the Mandela consensus, is no longer sustainable. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I suppose that excludes me because I rent. <laughs> um.